think to a lot of people, it's nothing but sunshine and rainbows to be able to, you know, finally use your street for, for people and not just for cars. Doesn't it feel good to walk down the street and not be bothered by cars? Well, it turns out that public space is actually great for your mental health and well-being. We will be discussing this and more in this new episode of The Urban, the podcast that delves into our relationship with the city and the urban lifestyle. Our city streets and parks have certainly never been as valuable to us as they have since the COVID-19 pandemic. Urban public space suddenly offers a much needed escape from the confines of home for a socially distanced walk. How strange for public spaces to now bring us together only to keep us apart. The same issues are not shared everywhere. Did you know that Hong Kong's urban public space by Capita is particularly small with only 2.7 square meters per resident? That goes up to 10 square meters per capita in New York. Not much, considering how valuable public spaces have become in a time of crisis or indeed at any other time. One message this virus represents is that we cannot keep organizing our cities the way we are now. That's what our guest today will tell us. We need a space in which to run and escape and act, says Saskia Sassen, world-renowned American sociologist, writer and a professor at Columbia University. COVID-19 has reopened the debate over which city model is preferable. San Francisco's inhabitants have their own view you on that will take you down their so-called slow streets, which have now arrived in Paris as well. What it is, is a, a very simple way to limit through traffic on neighborhood streets. Wait, who could have foreseen this and what comes next? Well, everybody in the profession thought we needed bigger housing. One architect called Susan Eliasson from the Grau Agency instead wondered whether we could reduce the size of each dwelling. She said that if we continue to think that to do better we need to build bigger, we're going to encourage more urban sprawl, which will continue to eat up agricultural land in order to expand the city. Alexandre Labasse here mentions one of the comments he received following his center's What Are We Doing Tomorrow call for contributions. Alexandre is the CEO of the Pavillon de l'Arsenal, Paris's center for urban planning and architecture. What are we doing tomorrow was the question they asked architects, citizens, students, engineers, and so on. In the end, 150 visions emerged and form a body of thought-provoking, sometimes discordant responses to the challenges facing our city today. We'll hear more from him soon. But first, are we entering a new era of struggle over public space or are we witnessing its comeback? Well, welcome to this new episode of The Urban. Hello, Saskia Sassen. It's great to have you on The Urban and thank you very much for joining us from London. Hi. Saskia, let's get started with one little exercise all of the show's guests are submitted to, and that is describing which object best incarnates in their eyes their vision of a city or their experience as urban inhabitants. Saskia, tell us, what's your city object? It's a great question, by the way. You have me thinking a bit because I think of many objects. But I think it is this notion that you are surrounded by people you do not know. And that is good. It's not a problem. Whereas in other settings outside a city, that could be a problem. So that is what just strikes me how when we are in the city, we all become urban subjects, even if that urbanity of ours lasts just for an hour when we're out there on the street. Urban subject or urban object in a phrase. So that means you enjoy, if I may say, feeling good in a, a, a public space. And that's your favorite topic, Saskia Sassen. Thanks for making my transition quite easy for this. So Saskia, you're a very cosmopolitan lady. You're a sociologist and you've experienced being in crowds in many cities, cities where you've lived, cities where you've traveled and cities, of course, where you have studied or which you have studied. My first question to you is, 
What's, what are the differences or what's different about public spaces that you've experimented in Europe, for example, compared to other continents? Well, the European continent, I would say, is quite something when it comes to this. To me, they, they really know how to construct cities where everybody feels more or less well. I cannot quite say that for Latin America, where I grew up. I cannot quite say that for certain parts of Africa where I have been. I think that the Europeans have a long, deep culture. And let's remember that, you know, a thousand years ago, there were like 600 separate entities there and they fought with each other, etc. And the United States is just simply a different place. The USA, Canada, Asia, They all have elements that the Europeans have, but they are definitely not European elements. They are not European cities, that's what I meant to say. What's the vision of a public space, maybe? Are there some countries where, you know, the, the, even the notion of a public space or the reality of a public space isn't there or wasn't there even recently? Well, the major trend is, of course, that upper middle class and very prosperous middle class families in more and more parts of the world, not necessarily in Europe, eh, but in Asia and in parts of Latin America, want to have private cities. These are partial cities, clearly, but that is the big trend. The big trend is in continents, in territories, you know, in countries where there is violence, there's a lot of violence. The middle classes, the rising middle classes, the established middle classes, they really would rather not be in, you know, live in a building that is on the street in a city. They would want to have private buildings and private, um, what do we call them, sort of private... Um, condominiums or... Yeah, condominiums areas. is another term, but, but where you take a whole bunch of houses, but it's all private. Like mm. India has done a lot of that lately. And that seems to be a preference for a lot of rising middle-class people so that they have both great houses and they have a whole space that could be part of a city, but in fact is private, protected with guards. That is a very significant mode that is rising in a lot of Asian parts, especially because there is also often the money to do that. But also we've seen it in Latin America. You know, Latin America is one of the most violent continents areas in the world that we have. And in those kinds of spaces, you see that. That is a serious, I would say, decline of the urbanity that I like so much. You know, an urbanity where everything is imperfect, yes, but it works. <laughs> And where, as you sometimes say, where this public space that we experiment becomes a place in which there's a momentary condition of equality, where complex trajectories, you know, are all around and suddenly equality appears. Exactly, where the poor and the... I, I just think that is so important. And my image, my dominant image for this is always when the end of the workday has come and we're all running to catch the train or the bus or whatever will take us there. And it's just a total mix of people from the very low-income worker to often the, maybe not the richest, but, you know, the high-income workers, which is a very large class in many of our big cities, and they also use public transport. So those are images for me that consolidate this notion that the urban condition is a very particular condition. And one of its features, one, not the only one, is that it can accommodate and sort of bring together the vastest variety of different types of, you know, livelihoods, politics, income levels, etc., etc. And also, of course, yes, ages, as you mentioned as well. So public spaces, are there still a common, a shared asset in your view? Yeah, public spaces are actually extremely important. One of the things that, yeah, and they are a kind of a special kind of asset and we should protect it, we should enable it. Europe is the leader, I think, in having secured this concept, you know, and executed the concept, which is this notion of public space, even in a big crowded city. And it is really important, once you begin to drop that, once the public space doesn't matter, are we still in a city 
or are we just in a vast complex of buildings? You know, that, that is one way of, of putting it. Because we have now nowadays, certainly in countries like in Latin America, with all its violence, etc., we have these huge privatized places with many, many different business buildings in it. And that is not urban. This may look urban from if you're in an airplane, you know, and you see this vast concentration of high towers. But it really, it de-urbanizes the urban condition. We'll get back to this uh, privatization of the uh, public space in a minute. Just a shared, a common asset is about, you know, the people who are on the sidewalk. But now this common asset and the sharing is also about having bicycles, having uh, people with cars, having people walking. And that's also a new way. People have to adjust to these new usages. Yes, And that is a wonderful feature, you know, and Paris, of course, has become sort of the international figure for that. But it is something, of course, in the Netherlands, we have been doing it for a long time in many countries in Europe, especially, right? But it's Latin America, North America, Asian countries, African countries, where that is going to be more difficult to execute, but where it would be wonderful that that could also happen there. And that is making what is happening in Europe on that front is really making a difference. It reconstitutes the whole concept of the city. And partly in that also hangs this notion of a sort of small mixes of shops where you can walk to and buy some of the essentials that you need every day. And then at some point you also have to go to the big supermarkets, but that you don't always have to go to the big supermarkets. And Paris is doing very well on that front, I think. She's sort of the queen of the domain on that one. And and that's interesting and everybody's talking about it. So clearly it, it will it's taking off. It's a concept that is taking off. Public and private transportation are also part of this public space, of course. Let me now fly you to San Francisco, Saskia, in the United States, with its wide city streets and idyllic suburban sprawls. Car culture is deeply woven into the fabric of society there. But in San Francisco, residents have been vocal about making transit a priority. Walking, biking and other sustainable modes of transportation have become a rallying cry. It's allowed the city to put forth a transit-first policy and like many cities in the United States, San Francisco is moving towards building the city city streets and public spaces to accommodate people first and not cars. Some of the city's ambitious goals are creating a network of protecting bike lines, expanding car-free spaces and expanding a slow streets program. Let's listen to Pamela Laurent's report. On a sunny afternoon in San Francisco's upscale Noe Valley neighborhood, residents were out jogging, riding skateboards and pushing baby strollers down several blocks of Sanchez Street, enjoying their local slow street. In late April, the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, or SFMTA, launched the Slow Streets program. Brian Wiedenmeyer, executive director of the non-profit San Francisco Bicycle Coalition, explains. What it is, is a, a very simple way to limit through traffic on neighborhood streets. So there are very simple barriers. Um, cars can still get around them and enter the street for neighbors who live uh, on those blocks, but they are not meant to be driven through. The COVID-19 pandemic made the need for the program more urgent. Tiffany Chu, CEO and co-founder at Remix, a platform for helping cities to plan transportation systems. Typically, you know, it takes years and years and years for something like a slow street or even a pop-up bike lane to be approved and implemented. And in the era of COVID, it's now taken folks, you know, a couple days, maybe a weekend. The goal is to close 34 miles of through traffic. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. This couple on Sanchez Street agreed. No cars and um, all those people, the babies, the kids are playing safe. Well, we had a baby, this one right here, on March 26th. So it's just been so nice. Like, there's nowhere to go. 
And so it's just been nice to have a place to walk her and feel safe and... To meet our neighbors. It's not without its problems, though. Tiffany Chu. I think to a lot of people, it's nothing but sunshine and rainbows to be able to, you know, finally use your street for for people and not just for cars. There has been a little bit of pushback around how those streets and corridors were identified. Um, I think the SFMTA, they were fairly comprehensive in taking a look at the whole city. And at the same time, I think I didn't see one in the Tenderloin. The western side of San Francisco tends to be higher income and whiter, whereas the eastern side is denser, lower income and has more communities of color. The Tenderloin is on the eastern side. Brian Wiedemeyer. We have been asking for the Slow Streets program to be expanded to the Tenderloin. The public health challenges are people can't navigate sidewalks safely. Seniors and people with disabilities don't feel safe walking on their streets. It's, I think it's an injustice that, that people who live there face now with this terrifying pandemic and public health lens laid over it. The crowded sidewalks and lack of parks in the Tenderloin has made it a challenge for people to keep the recommended six feet of social distancing there. It's seen one of the highest rates of COVID-19 in the city. Back on Sanchez Street on a Sunday afternoon, a band was playing and the crowd was safely spread out on their slow street. We all love it. So very clearly, Saskia, uh, the uh, COVID crisis has accelerated the uh, implementation of slow streets there in San Francisco. Is this COVID-19 crisis an opportunity for public space in your view? Well, it's very difficult for me to say that it is not. I must say I am totally inclined to think that it is indeed an opportunity. At the same time, uh, one thinks of the people who have died, especially older people, poor people. Poor people have suffered a lot under this. And then, of course, some other set of issues enter the picture. It's not all nice. But I completely agree with this notion that we need to strengthen our cities to sort of deal with all kinds of situations in an intelligent way. You know, what I have noticed in in working cities is there is a kind of intelligence that is built into how people conduct themselves, the rules of the game, you know, and, and that is actually remarkable. You never hear people say a city is intelligent, except if they are these new types of buildings, you know, that have intelligent systems in them. And so, but this notion that a city and a street can actually be marked by a kind of intelligence, an intelligence that unites the stones, the, you know, whatever that street is, with the people who use it. It's a nice image. I hadn't thought about it. You've developed a theory on the possibility of doing, of acting in a public space. What's the sense of that? And how does that match with the situation we are in right now? By the situation we're in right now, you mean that Many of us are not much on the street because of the pandemic. What I mean is that because of the pandemic, we've changed our view on public spaces very clearly, how valuable they are in our eyes, but also how they now keep us apart. So what can we do? How can we act now when we are in public spaces? Well, of course, the pandemic is a very distinctive element huh? and it it cannot be made generic, like daily life, poverty, or, you know, it is a different condition because it is an arc. It will eventually subside. It is already beginning to subside, though in some parts it is also rising again. So, you know, it's a complicated little animal, they're invisible, (laughs) invisible being that has us all a bit terrified. But the thing about the street is that the street, you know, nobody can claim it. No person, you may be rich, you may be that or that, you cannot claim it. The real street, because there are private streets, that's another matter. But the real street is a space for for anybody. And that what I adore is that mix of poor and rich, etc. And that is more important probably for the poor than it is for the rich. But for the rich, it also is significant. You know, that that there are times when those rich are actually rubbing shoulders with the cleaners that they also employ. 
something like that. Beyond that, the street is a space where you can dance and sing and install modalities that are very, very temporary, but that we don't forget. You know, when you launch a little bit of a, of a dance situation or something in a street, people will not forget that. It's not like going to a place. It's your street. And so that's also very important. And then finally, I do think that we have regained a recognition and an interest in the street. You know, for a while there, we really lost it because there were so many other issues that we didn't talk much about streets. But I think we're back to recognizing that the street is a very special space. And of course, the streets go back millennia, you know. And commerce is, of course, part of the story too there. And commerce is basic to a functioning city, a functioning sense of membership. Put all those things together and the little street can also be a big street, is actually a phenomenal type of presence in our lives. I mean, you know, in Berlin, they have opened up these private, I mean, years ago now, these private streets, but they just didn't look private. People assumed these are public streets. In fact, there were streets that are going to be private for 20 or 30 years, and then who knows what happens with them. But still, the fact that the ownership becomes an invisible factor It's important because people feel freer. What about these ritualized public spaces? Do you think that, for example, those private streets that you've just mentioned in Berlin, or that these slow streets that we see emerging in San Francisco or even here in Paris can become ritualized public spaces, which in your view differs from indeterminate public space. Right, good point, very good point. Yes, absolutely, I think that is happening and I would say that the, what the Mairie in Paris has been accomplishing is, is quite impressive and it's just great, it's just very exciting because Paris is a huge city, you know, it is not a tiny city and it has a vast amount of traffic and enormous battalions of tourists and there she is. Ana Hidalgo has really done a great job. Now, she comes from Spain, you know, and I just keep wondering, is it something about her Spain experience that has led her to have this courage? And you know how the French complain? I mean, they're loud complainers. You know, they like to complain. They love complaining. <laughs> and she managed. She managed to transform that city and people love it. Of course it is imperfect, of course it is partial, but it is a new model in the same way of the, the six-minute city, you know, where you can walk, you don't have to take a car or a bus, you can walk to the shop where you need to shop. These are really emergent conditions and I think they are very, very good. But in which way is there a ritual there or here in Paris? What's, what's a ritual? A ritual or? in the sense that it becomes a mode of dwelling in that space. You don't have to explain yourself. You join a certain mode that sort of emerges from many, many different types of people being in that space. And that space has limits to what you can do there. But when you function within those limits and maximize what you can do within those limits, then you have discovered something. You have discovered in this piazza, I can do ABC. In that other piazza, not. In this street, I can do ABC. In that other street, not. So there's a kind of knowledge function that enters the picture and that makes some streets and some little piazzas eh, amazingly interesting. And there are points of destination. We have seen that in New York City too. And New York City is a rather problematic city, poor city. But uh, you see that there. And I think that is nice. I think, you know, people need to spend time on the street. That is also very important. It also relies on the way we act in such public spaces. We do not act in the same way when we are in our neighborhood than when we are in a big street where no one knows us. In which way has the COVID-19 crisis also changed the way we can act or do in our city? We are now wearing masks everywhere. Nobody knows us, even in our neighborhood, I would say. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, this, this is a formidable little 
not enormous, but it's a formidable little change that we are living through. And that I would say most of us, except in certain types of cities, you know, where people are a bit silly and they say, wow, we don't need this. Like in America, we're seeing a lot of that in certain areas. So feeling free. Well, joining us now is Alexandre Labasse, CEO of the Pavillon de l'Arsenal. Alexandre and his team put out a call for contributions while Paris was in lockdown called What Are We Doing Tomorrow? More than 150 architects, students, engineers and urban planners responded to the call. All their texts have been posted on the platform in their original form. These differing visions present each person's concerns for all to see and we asked Alexandre about his own vision of a city. For me, a city is a shared space. It presumes that we can live together in harmony, which is essential for community. This crisis has unearthed existing questions while also revealing new issues. And at the heart of this is now the issue of solidarity, of overcrowding or proximity. We'd maybe not thought much about these issues in a modern city, but they've once again become the primary challenge when building a city. A city is shared on every level, territorial, neighborhoods, public spaces and housing. So ultimately it's up to everyone, and the way people live in the city poses this question about shared space and allows change to take place. In Paris today we have something like 200 residential blocks representing 130,000 inhabitants. It's about how we put them in the service of the city, the residents, the plots, the 700,000 meters squared of rooftops and the 15,000 parking spaces below. This seems important to us today, it's about how we keep community bonds and how we share this common ground. Putting in place this notion of sharing is a long-term job because it doesn't really bring the urban form into question, at least the part that interests architects or urban planners. But it's the way in which we conceive it, the way in which we program the urban form, the way we manage it afterwards, or the way we can imagine it in a completely holistic way. So it's completely new and at the same time fundamental, so difficult to implement in a concrete way, that's for sure. What some contributions in the uh, Pavillon de l'Arsenal's experience have shown that there's a tendency to eliminate public spaces, mega projects that take whole chunks of the city and turn it into private spaces. How seriously do we have to take that in your opinion? Is this the beginning or the continuity of a, an urban takeover? Yeah, I, I think it can be a serious problem. In some cases, you know, a big industry or something like that, uh, that needs a lot of space, uh, we have to consider whether it's good nonetheless to have them in the city rather than them moving out to outside the city. And it depends on the city. A city that is already overwhelmed, like a city like New York, a city like London, they don't need many more enterprises moving in. But there are cities, especially I'm now thinking of, you know, sort of medium-sized cities, where having a big enterprise would really add, you know, it would add potentially a certain kind of uh, complexity. Now, the problem, of course, is when, when a big enterprise enters in a, in a smaller city and it absorbs too much of that space, then, then that's a negative. So it's a, it's a really, it's a delicate balance. In the long run of history, cities have shown us what survives in a city and what doesn't survive. So a lot of projects that thought that they would thrive in cities, but big projects, you know, sort of truly commercial operations, etc., they actually then did not survive very well because the city itself will create constraints. But, you know, what we have today is in many cities you have an area sort of that is a bit maybe at one edge of a city or one side of a city, which functions as a huge, you know, field for big firms to operate. And they are not really quite visible. It's like they are only, they are just sort of close to the city, but not in the city. And that is a way of rescuing the real city that is in play, which may be a very a city that is a bit modest, you know, that doesn't have a lot of resources and that is threatened by a huge corporation that creates a field there. You know, I mean, some of these big corporations nowadays occupy vast amounts of space and those you don't want in the middle of your city. You would want them at the edge of your city. What's 
dangerous in turning public spaces into private spaces. You lose something. And once you have done that, those who wanted that switch know why they wanted it. And chances are that they're making it theirs or that they're using it in a way that benefits them. And sometimes these are frivolous decisions and sometimes they actually come with a, with a hump, you know, that they really knew what they wanted. They wanted to have control over that particular space. I'm talking about particular types of enterprises wanting that kind of control. So, you know, it can be okay, but it can also be a negative. I think we, the city is, of course, a place that has seen it all, so to speak, a whole range of different modes, a big city, a whole range of different modes in which firms, very powerful firms, etc., install themselves in those cities. But is it only a problem, I would say, of firms? Other people, other entities uh, can turn public spaces into private spaces. Yes. And we have a situation, for instance, in both London and New York, where a lot of space that we thought was public space was private space. They just hadn't occupied it. And so one has an image, oh, look, this big open space with just a few buildings there, it can function as a wonderful new park with buildings, etc. And then it turns out, hell no, you can't because it's actually private property. This is something that began to happen, you know, in the last 20 years. In an earlier epoch, <clears throat> we didn't quite have it that way. It was all, all was more, more visible, I think. And so this is something that, this land grabbing, you know, which we know about land grabbing for mining and for big plantations. Well, you know, some of that land grabbing is now entering the city. And that is a problem. It often does work to the advantage of very large and powerful firms. There is one final point that I would add, which which is a bit invisible probably to the eye of the average uh, resident. And that is that a sector like high finance, for instance, which I have done a lot of work on, that is a sector that actually is commanding an enormous amount of space in our major cities. And it commands that space in a way that is sort of invisible to the eye. We just see more buildings, more towers. But the fact that a very powerful sector, an extraordinarily rich sector, high finance, we're talking billions and billions. I mean, it's one of the richest sectors that we have. That that begins to grab, literally grab, more and more space in a city like New York, in a city like London, et cetera, et cetera. That I find very problematic. And that's just convenience. This is another point, you know, that is rarely mentioned. And before I forget mentioning it, and that is that cities which, you know, which have very, very lively, very active economic centers often inevitably command a whole variety of workers who have very, very long distance trips, you know, leaving their homes from smaller cities, etc., and then long trip and long trip back, that should stop. Because the only ones who gain in that are the top staff, you know, and the middle staff who can live in the city. For them, it's fine. But a lot of the workers are simply, that's a mode of exploitation in my view. I hadn't quite thought about this until maybe five or ten years ago, when I decided, you know what this means, the fact that these big firms insist in enabling these huge cities to expand, means that they don't care about the fact that many of the workers will have extraordinarily long trips. They just take it for granted. But those firms should reorganize themselves. If they need that many workers, they should not be enabled to hire workers that have a two-hour trip coming in and going back because they don't care, because they live in the center of the city. That is a kind of selfishness that is mindless. Most of these people don't even think about these issues that I'm just raising here. That, to me, those are the serious problems that cities need to confront. And so what exactly, what, what's the role of city councils, what's the role of city inhabitants to prevent such situations to happen and to keep a um, public space a, a common asset? 
Right. It, it is really not easy. It is going, it is a battle. These are, I have seen little battles in New York and in London where it has succeeded. You might have seen little battles in Paris because Paris also has built up this huge complex, you know, of, of firms. But what we've seen in Paris recently is also the eruption of amazing bike lanes that was following the uh, the lockdown that we had to experiment and that's a first victory for inhabitants so in that sense the city council and inhabitants have been able to win over a battle for public space Absolutely. And Paris is a very good example. You can't quite say that about New York. New York hasn't done as well. And nor do I think has London. But Paris has done, I mean, you know, Paris is now in the global news because it succeeded at that. And we all respect to the, the Parisian, the people who fought for it, the mayor, Ana Hidalgo, she did things that her advisor said, you can't do that, you can't do that. Well, She did, and she has some great people. I know some of those people. They are amazing people. They are determined. And that shows you that a mayor who is not a very powerful person in our complex systems, a mayor who has a plan where a good chair of the local people say, yes, I like that, that she can succeed. You know, and, and this, we cannot forget this. We don't want to forget this, that... But it takes work. It takes courage. Ana Hidalgo is a formidable person, you know, and she fought for that. Most people said she's not going to succeed. Well, she did succeed. And now the challenge is the six minute or whatever city, right, that you have a lot of concentrations of the essential shops in many, many places of the city so that people can walk in order to buy the food they need. You know, it's just beautiful. So finally, after a long battle over the use of share land, are we now, Saskia Sassen, witnessing a comeback for public space? Yes, I think we are. I mean, there are several epochs in play here, right? And they come with different meanings in different cities. Thanks so much, Saskia Sassen, for sharing your views with us. And talk to you soon, my dear listeners. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> 